us in our lives and we're sitting here, our ability to connect with God and to connect with our spouses is being challenged. And I want to hold before you just very simply something the Lord has been chatting to me about. And that is my relationship with the thing that right now is in my bag. I should have taken it out, but it's in my bag. It's our intense desire to connect via social media. And I know it's like this is relationship talk, so what does social media have to do with my relationship with my spouse? I want to say to you almost everything. Uh, there's a picture up there, and it sort of illustrates the points a little bit. But you've got this guy in the desert. He's longing for water. That's what he needs to survive. That's what his body needs. That's what he really needs. And he's, he's put between a choice to go for the water or to go for the internet, and he, he goes for the internet. <laughs> of course, that's ridiculous. You know, none of us will do that. They're just silly. But sometimes this happens. There's a, there's a need to be connected. If you go to the next slide. There's a need, to be, there's, there's a need for connection there between a mom and a child. You know, but there's another connection and connections going on there. I just quickly need to check this and just quickly need to chat to this person. And at least we're together. <laughs> at least we're in the same physical room. But there's some connections not taking place there that are very important, that are very crucial. And again, maybe this is ahead of the time for some of you. You guys might not be there yet. Some of you might, might be in, a, um, in the same room, having a thousand different conversations with a thousand different people, and yet being blocked off, not hearing each other. There's just a crazy stat up here. It says that, <clears throat> you know, most of us are in a situation, in a space where we can't go one hour even. Some of us have challenges in this room right now, sitting through the service, not checking our phones. Most of us check our phones every hour, a few times. You can go through the, through the stats there. Some of us even go to bed like this. Some of us maybe wake up that way. I know that most of you guys and all of you here are committed to being the best God has called you to be for your spouse. Becoming the best doesn't happen one day when you meet her and when you get married. Becoming the best starts now. The habits that you allow to take place in your life right now, you will take with you into your marriage. This ring will not deliver you from whatever habit you are allowing in your life right now. So ground rule to my wife and I is that the phone does not go into the bedroom. It charges inside, in the living room. When we have dinner, it's not on the dining room table. And it took my wife to tell me, Heinrich, you've got a relationship with that phone. And again, you know, woman, what, what do you, I mean, come on. Don't you know, I'm, this, I'm using Evernote to prepare my sermons. I don't buy newspapers. I, I use News 24. I don't have DSTV. I've got Crick Info. So cut me some slack. You know, I'm, I'm at least better than most other guys I know. <laughs> no, 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 no. Most other guys are not in relationship with my wife. I am. <laughs> and I need to give to her what she needs. I'm responsible. God holds me responsible. One day, God will come to Heinrich and will ask Heinrich, Heinrich, what did you do with Nikki? How did you love her? And, and I'm going to appeal to some of you guys, you need to set some boundaries in place right now with your phones. You've got to be strong enough. Trust the Holy Spirit. God, help me. You deliver me from some of these things that I'm carrying with me. And the good news is God can deliver you. The good news is God wants to deliver you. The good news is God wants to make sure that you give everything that you can to the woman of your dreams and to the husband of your dreams. Let me turn up the heat a bit. Isaiah 62 verse 5 says, For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is the beauty of marriage, guys. God looks at marriage and he says to the world, there's something about the joy of a, of a man finding a woman. 
falling in love with her. Um, Nikki was doing her, her Zuma here in Beaufort West, um, of all places, you know. And that's why I happened to be born as well. So it's just like amazing how God organized that. So I was living in, in Stellenbosch. I was teaching at Porus. I was living in the Corsais. Almost died amongst all those grade nines, but I survived. I was in the res there wanting to save money, right? That's why I was living in the res. Wanted to save money for the wedding day coming up. And yet every second weekend, I was driving to Beaufort West. I mean, how much money do you save doing that? Very little, all right? But I wanted to be, I wanted to be with her. I wanted to be with her. I couldn't stop thinking of her. You know, it was it, my heart just, just thinking about opportunities to connect with her, thinking about opportunities to, to just let her know that I, I love her. And I would phone my friends to deliver flowers and would write letters to her. And it would just so that she can know that my heart is for her. Something about that reflects God's heart for you and for me. God sets up this entire evening so that you can know that He loves you. He, he works on your desire for a spouse to get you here <laughs> so that you can know that He loves you, that He delights in you, that He, that he, that he drove not from Stellenbosch to Beaufort West, but from heaven to earth all the way from the, from the manger to the cross, to the grave, and then up to heaven again for you. That He delights in you, that He rejoices over you, that He will choose you over and over and over and over and over again. Irrespective of how badly you've messed up, He delights in you. And I know that, that you know, that your ability to delight in someone else flows out of your receptivity. To God delighting in you. If you don't know how much God delights in you, you will make your delighting in someone else conditional. I will delight in you as long as the food is good, the house is neat and tidy, the money comes in, the car is filled with petrol, the sex is good, the kids are behaving well. Uh, conditions. But if you know the grace of God that delights in you, not because of what you have done, but because of what He has done, and that you are in Him, then that brings a dimension to your relationship with your loved one. It takes it beyond conditions. So what's the best thing? What's the best preparation you can do for meeting your husband? Fall more in love with Jesus. Grow in your understanding of how much He loves you. Camp out around His love for you. That's why we sang the songs tonight. The greatest blessing, the greatest gift you can give your spouse is knowing the love of God. Because out of that place, you can give to them. And then again, marriage will bring you to the end of even your capacity. If I think now, 13 years later, the day I stood in front of the altar and said, love, I love you. Looking back at it now, I realize I didn't know what I was saying. You know, I, I sort of an inkling of an idea, but, but right now I've got a much greater understanding of what that means. Our love grows as we go through tough times together. As we have to reevaluate our, our vows and we, we've got to make commitments to God again and we've got to say, God, we will not get up from our knees until you come to reestablish our unity, our connection. We're not in this for expediency or just for comfort or just for the joy. We are in this for your purposes. But right now, God, we're missing each other. Right now, we're speaking in tongues to one another and we don't have the gift of interpretation. No one knows what we're saying. We're missing each other's hearts. We need you, Jesus, to come. And he's faithful and he does it over and over and over again. God rejoices over you people. He delights over you. Daniel 11 verse 32, uh, um, Daniel, is, he has a prophecy and he speaks prophetically uh, over, over a king that would come. And, 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 and many people use this for the spirit of the age and the Antichrist as well. It says that he, he shall seduce the this, this spirit, this, this, this Antichrist shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant. He says, he will come and he will seduce with flattery. He will lead you astray. Like Facebook can often lead you astray. <laughs> Before you know it, it's half an hour, an hour, two hours. You've just been scrolling through Facebook, spying on other people, living your life to what other people are doing instead of having a life yourself. You're just being led astray. You know? It says, but men's health, cosmopolitan, all of those things, they want to lead you astray into, into living a life built upon the externals. Look this way, dress this way, smell this way, go to the gym this often, uh, and then you will be good enough. He says, no, 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 no. I haven't called you to live on that plane. I haven't called you to live there. I haven't called you to live there on the plane of the natural and impressing people. 
and trying to win people's approval. I've called you to live on the plane of the people who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. That knowing speaks about intimacy. It speaks about being one with God. And, and, the, and that intimacy leads to action. And so again, for some of you, you guys, strap on your courage, all right? Strap it on. Tell a brother, I'm going to chat to that girl. Pray for me. <laughs> I'm going to ask her out. I'm, and I'm going to say to her, this is not a wedding proposal, okay? I want to ask you out for a movie. I'm not asking you to get married. Please don't run away from me. I'm asking you out for a movie because I like you. Please also don't pretend that it's just, you just want a movie because you've got nothing else to do. Don't waste the time. I want to go to a movie, to a movie with you because I like you and I would like to get to know you better. Keep it simple. And girls, when a guy comes to you that honest, knows it took a lot of guts. So don't just bat the guy, you know. Show some respect. <laughs> Show some love. And just say, okay, it's just a movie, right? Are we on the same page? It's just a movie? Okay, I can deal with the movie. You know, he's going to pay for the movie in any case. And the popcorn. <laughs> and if he doesn't, if he, if he asks you to pay for your, your popcorn, then bat him, of course. <laughs> you know? Phone see us. Tell see us, please. You know, we need to know, brother. We need to drive those demons out of the guy. Guys, if you need to borrow money from your friend, do it. But make her understand that she's worth it. Make her understand that she's worth it. <laughs> one of the greatest challenges, one of the greatest challenges of pornography is that it tells us as guys that girls are cheap. You don't have to put in any effort to get to the goal. And within pornography, the goal is self-satisfaction. That's the goal. So I will just use this woman. And so, and so, so we've got a whole generation of men that don't know how to sacrifice. They don't know how to, they know how to put your, your pride on the line. And guys, you will only be happy if you are the warrior God has called you to be. Nail your colors to the mast. Say, if I die, I'm going to die fighting. I'm going to go down in a blaze of glory. <laughs> I'm going to go out and spend my last money on this movie and this popcorn, and I'm going to fast for a week. <laughs> but I'm going to do it. <laughs> and then I'm going to phone her and let her know, thank you so much for coming with me to the movie. I hope you had fun. I had fun. And when you ask her, oh, don't text her. Would you like to go in a movie? Phone her, ask her. Show some. Okay, this guy is saying I must stop. Uh, it's like a few, mo few more minutes left. All right, I must, I must stop. Jesus was a man that wasn't afraid to, to show his love, to show it to us publicly. And I believe that the world waits for men who will do that. The world, world waits for, for women who will allow men to do that. When a guy wants to pay, don't insist on paying, girls. If he wants to give you something, allow him to give it. Allow him to be the man. Allow him to open the door for you. Allow him the opportunity to be masculine. Allow him the space to Make mistakes as well. He's still figuring this out, all right? There's no manual. I mean, you don't even understand yourself most of the time. So how can you expect? <laughs> I'm married. I've got two girls. I've got three women in my life. Right? So I know what I'm talking about. Don't expect the guy to have the word of knowledge to know what you are feeling. Okay, to know what movie you really wanted to watch when he asked you and you said, no, any movie will be fine. And now you're upset with him because he took you to watch Tarzan. Don't. Don't do that to the guy. Help him. Help him. We need your help. Amen, guys? We need your help. 
Be honest with us. Tell us this is what you like. And then celebrate whatever little bit he can give you. Celebrate whatever little bit he can give you right now. Don't compare it to the next guy or the other guy. Celebrate what's in front of you right now. Irrespective of whether the guy becomes your spouse or not. If you cultivate, ladies, the art of celebration now, with the men around you and the things around you now, that is one of the greatest gifts you will take into your marriage one day. Celebrating your husband. The world is tough. Bringing home the provision, it's, it's tough. It's a tough world. And many of you girls, you will work in those environments as well. But for men, there's a lot of identity we attach to our work. And when the man comes home, he wants to know there's a place where he gets celebrated. Even before he's done anything worthwhile, celebrating it. Before the house has been paid off, before the honeymoon, incredible money is being spent, before all of those things, he's being celebrated for who he is. So how do I finish this off when I'm only halfway through my slides? <laughs> Second Kings 20. Isaiah the prophet comes to King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah was one of the last kings in Israel before the Babylonian captivity. Okay, and he's, the Lord just healed him miraculously. He was almost ill. He prayed. God saved his life. Added, was it 15 years or so to his life? Then Babylonian emissaries come. You know, like in Sparta, they sent the Persian emissaries to Sparta. But in any case, uh, to, to Israel, Babylonian emissaries come. And this king does something that upsets the prophet. And so the prophet comes to Hezekiah and says to him, well, what did these men say and from where did they come to you? And so Hezekiah says, they came from a far country, from Babylon. And he said, what have they seen in your house? This is before the Babylonian captivity. This is before the Babylonian kings decided that Israel is a country worth invading and worth capturing. They come to this king. And this king does something very foolish. He, he takes them on a tour. Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There's nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. And what happens? He exposes treasures before it's time. And he exposes those treasures to the wrong people. And so his people, his nation, gets taken captive. Because he exposed the secret, beautiful things of the house of God. That should never have been exposed. Some of you in this room need to make certain quality decisions concerning the treasures that lie locked up in your heart. Beautiful things that don't belong to anyone else except God and one day your husband and your wife. Some of your hearts have been taken captive, have been taken places because you exposed something that was destined not to be exposed before it's time. Lord Jesus wants to heal you tonight. He wants to bring you back from captivity. Bring your heart back from feeling that shame, feeling that anger, feeling that worthlessness, so that you can walk into your marriage, not perfect, but on a much greater path of healing. Because it's a lifelong process being healed. Please don't also wait until you sort it out, okay? You're going to wait a long time. So I want to just take you to two treasures very quickly, okay? And then I'm going to pray for you. The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good, and the evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth what is evil, for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Your heart is a treasure. It's a storehouse. Some of you have been giving that storehouse away. So, so it happens that you get into a relationship, a, a friendship, and you just start sharing. Just like, boo, your entire testimony in five minutes. Everything that has happened to you. Don't do that. Give the guy an opportunity to get to know you. Give him an opportunity to get to know your trust. Trust takes time. But don't, don't, don't overexpose, don't overshare. And, and, and ladies and guys as well, listen to what comes out of someone's mouth, especially when they are praying. I want to encourage you not to make any decision concerning someone, whether they f they're the right person for you, until you have heard that person actually pray. What comes out of his mouth in, in a moment of just connecting with God? What comes out of his or her mouth in a moment of pressure when something goes wrong? 
Listen to that. Don't, don't ignore it. Don't just think, oh, this is going to change one day when, when we're married. Listen to it. Treasure inside of, inside of your heart. And then the last one that we, I, I really just want to finish off on is the treasure of sexual intimacy. Okay, one of the greatest blessings of sexual intimacy within, within marriage is the treasure that God has given us to become one. Intimacy. Now today we talk about connecting on on Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever. Let's just connect. I believe the reason why it's so popular is because within us is a longing to become one with someone else, to really be known, to really be understood. And within a sexual union, God gives us that opportunity to not be ashamed, to just be yourself in the bad times and the good times, when you've done well and when you haven't done well, to be accepted and celebrated by someone else. The second reason why it's a treasure is because God has given us the ability to bring other eternal beings into this world. Just think about that. Sexual intimacy is a treasure because God designs us to, designs sexual intimacy uh, so that we can know someone like nobody else can. My wife and I, we're best friends and we share a lot of things in our lives, but you know, there's, there's, there's something that only the two of us have in common with one another. Nobody else has that. We want an intimate level just between the two of us. It's one treasure God has given us to share. Nobody else can get close to that. It's ours. The other reason why it's a treasure is because through sexual intimacy, someone is born that will live, or there's a potential for someone to be born that will live for and ever and ever and ever. That's why it's a treasure that should not be given away because it's a holy moment the third reason why it's a beautiful treasure is because through sexual union god actually brings us closer to the point where we can release the power of agreement we can be one we can say god even as we thank you for making us one in the flesh we thank you we're one in the spirit we thank you that even though we disagree over a few things we are united around we will not miss your purpose for our lives we come into agreement and we stand in faith that your purpose for our lives will be established the devil has come to rob some of you of your ability to connect with God and to connect with the people around you. You've lost your treasure of intimacy. He's come to rob some of you of your desire to see people saved because you've fallen sexually. And the root actually is your shame. And you don't, you don't feel you can be productive anymore. You fear becoming a mom or a dad even. Tonight God wants to heal you. He wants to set you free. For some of you, you live in isolation. You don't know the power of agreement. You don't know what it means to have someone that stands in faith with you till God's purposes come to pass. And the reason for that is you have given the treasure away. Tonight, God wants to bring your treasure back. He wants to restore your heart and He wants to give you hope. So this is the verse that I want to finish off with. If you can stand, I want to pray this over you. John Elridge in Love and War, he says the following. He says, God created marriage as a living, breathing portrait laid out before the eyes of the world so that they might see the story of the ages, a love story. It's a story of redemption, a story of healing. It is a story of love. Our love is meant to be a picture both of his love and his fight. And here's the good news. God is fighting for you and he's fighting for your marriage. He's fighting for your spouse to be, and he's fighting for your children. God is committed to you becoming everything as destined you to be.